2014 was a weird year for games. Pretty forgettable, but at the same time, there's a nostalgia there. It was the first true year of the next-gen consoles at the time, Xbox One and PlayStation 4. And although most of the games from this year didn't age entirely well, I have a deep nostalgia for them. The first crossover into next gen, similar to the games from 2005 and 2006 from Xbox 2360 and the PS2 to the PS3. There's something special about that period, a period we're actually in right now. It's fitting, I didn't even think about that. There were a couple of games in 2014 that I really liked. Forza Horizon 2 is very memorable. I had a ton of fun in Titanfall 2 and the Halo Master Chief Collection, although it had a rocky launch, the game itself turned into one of, if not my favorite Halo product. I still play it almost every day. One, however, that I feel gets swept under the radar, that gets almost forgotten, a game that was actually incredibly impressive back then is Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor. It was the first time we saw a proper attempt at a game set in the Lord of the Rings universe. Not an RTS, not a movie adaptation or anything of the like. A full AAA title that set itself firmly within Mordor, the dark land controlled by Sauron and his forces. Somewhere that is set up in Lord of the Rings as Darkness Incarnate. That alone is a quality setup for a video game, containing the player within the land of Mordor and setting your story there. I haven't played Shadow of Mordor since 2014, well I mean I've probably touched it, but I've never sat down and played it start to finish, focusing on the game and soaking it all in. I genuinely don't know if it's as good as I remember. I could play it and feel that it's lacking, it's aged badly, or it's just boring, but there's only one way to find out. So first things first, this game isn't canon to Lord of the Rings, which at first does feel like a bit of a turnoff. I mean, it fits into the world, it's just not canon to it. It's kind of hard to explain because it doesn't, at least not to my very limited knowledge of Lord of the Rings, break any obvious canon, unlike its sequel which just goes a little bit mental. But Shadow of Mordor fits nicely between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and although not canon, doesn't do anything lore-breaking story-wise. But in universe, it definitely pushes the boundaries of what was set up by Tolkien, and I understand why it's not canon from that perspective, but also Tolkien had no involvement obviously, so it can't technically be canon anyway. Maybe you could consider it canon to the films, I don't think it really matters anyway. It's more of an alternate reality, a what if of sorts. Now one thing this game does nicely is character art. Everyone feels like they fit into Middle Earth and more importantly, Mordor. But also Talion himself, the character we play as, he looks cool. And I think it's important for a game like this. It's not trying to be deep or meaningful or realistic or grounded. It's trying to be a cool fantasy game based on Lord of the Rings, and our protagonist looks cool, and that's cool. Although I do have to say, I don't like it when games don't let me see my outfit in cutscenes. I wore the cool hood and cloak thing for most of the game because I'm a sneaky boy and it felt right. Also, when you run, it flicks the cloak about, and I like that a lot. But cutscenes are pre-rendered, so you end up just seeing his original outfit. Not a huge issue, but it bothers me more than it probably should. Mordor is established quickly as a land of darkness. Being able to enter it and see it firsthand is honestly a huge lure of the game. Getting up in the faces of these orcs and seeing the darkened red skies, it feels like the place is being made out to be. I mean, that's, that's definitely dark. I <laughs> and to top it all off, this game looks gorgeous still to this day. Granted, I'm playing on PC at 4K with the settings maxed out running at 60fps, something I never experienced on my Xbox One back in 2014, but the point still stands. The visuals hold up incredibly well. So many angles of this game look stellar, and the smooth animations only help to bolster the game's immersion. One of my favourite things about it, to be honest, is feeling grounded in this world and setting by the visuals and animation quality. This game has aged very well in the graphics department, for sure. So the narrative. I don't ever remember being an entirely strong part of this game, and I think I feel the same. Although to be fair, I did expect the story to be pretty much non-existent, but I did find some interesting moments and lore were present, which I don't think I really expected to find, which was nice. The game drops you into things as Talion, a ranger at the Black Gate. There's a lot of backstory there, but it's not really relevant. His family's murdered brutally by the Black Hand of Sauron, who might just be Sauron, or like, Sauron's living in him? 
I don't know, because at the end, after taking Killer Brimble from Talion, the Black Hand just becomes Sauron. I've never fully understood why specifically. I could look it up, but honestly, I prefer the scuffed explanations in the comments of this video. I didn't care too much about Talion's family, more the manner in which they were killed. Honestly, it's a good substitute for character development. Just show him with his son and his wife, and then kill them in the most horrific way you can think of. Even if you don't care about them, you'll care about what happened to them. It gives you a reason to want to fight these villainous characters in the Hammer, the Tower, and the Hand of Sauron. Sets you on your journey quite nicely for a game that, like I said, doesn't try to be that deep. Being joined with Keller Brimbor, the Ringmaker, and in this non-canon universe, he actually forged all of the rings, not just the original three from Tolkien's work. He also helped Sauron reforge the One Ring as well. It's actually confusing as fuck, especially since it's told in these dreamy flashback sequences, which are by nature unclear. But the game never properly clears up the minor details, so you're sort of left wondering, what did he do? And why did he do it? Is he good or evil? I don't know what he wants. You meet a ton of characters while you're out on your journey. So you didn't die ten years ago. <laughs> what? Ratbag is an interesting one. He's funny, but also sort of out of place. He acts like a sort of Jar Jar Binks almost, getting into trouble. He doesn't feel like any of the other orcs and just serves as a comic relief plot device to make certain things happen in the story. The way Talion interacts with him too is odd. The game becomes funny whenever he's around, and honestly, it did at points break my immersion. You show him to take the place of the dead war chief. Um, but the war chief's not dead. I'm going to go kill him! That feels like Star Wars sequel trilogy humor. Torvin is another character you meet later on. He's a hunter, he's not a bad character, it's just all of his missions are pretty filler and boring. I think to be honest, when the game railroads you, you start to realize how boring a lot of the base gameplay actually is. Context matters, and when you're let loose to focus on the nemesis system, which we'll talk about, or do cool things and fight big enemies, it shines. But when you're following a dwarf as he gives you exposition about his life, then learns to hunt Karagors, it's just a bit dead. Lithariel is a fine character, like most of the characters. There's not a great deal of depth, but she's kind of cool. Other than the fact she gets captured, actually, like, Every character just ends up captured as a reason for Talion to get involved in something. You don't even really know what they did. The cutscene just starts and, oh, they've been captured. Better sneak in and save them, I guess. Overall, the story is fine. It's not offensively bad, but it's hardly something to write home about. I think if they played into Talion being a sort of Master Chief-esque character, just full of one-liners, insanely powerful, cool as shit, it could have been better than trying to humanize him because they don't really try hard enough. There's moments like this that are pretty damn cool. Bring me the head! Of this grave walker. Claim the head yourself. And more of that wouldn't have gone missed. Like I already said, the ending, it, it's its a bit messy. It feels like it's a setup to a sequel more than anything, and honestly, I still don't even know what happened. I think it's most confusing because I can't tell which parts are grounded in Tolkien lore and which parts they've taken liberties with, so it ends up being this mush of confusion that I can't shake no matter how much I try to straighten it out. Granted, there might be a good explanation, it might make perfect sense if someone explains it to me, but that doesn't change the fact that the actual game conveys it so poorly for me, which is why it's good that the rest of the game is so bloody fun. So this game is open world. It's not huge at all, there are two very small maps to play within. Uden and Nern, I think that's how you say it, which are two locations inside of Mordor. One is very red and rocky, another luscious and full of grass. They're nice contrasts to each other, and the size of them makes them easy to navigate. You never feel inconvenienced by their size, which is quite rare to find in open world games these days. Now, of course, the world is full of collectible items and such. It wouldn't be an open world game without them, although some might wish it could be. One collectible in particular I found was interesting was one that gives you little memories. Once you find an item and then scan it in the menu, you can find memory imprints, which allow you to view back story for that specific item in an area of the world. It's a really nice addition and helps breathe life into Mordor. And off the back of that, the lore menu is pretty cool, lets you see more about the locations, the people, and the history of many subjects that are present in the game. Definitely was interesting for me as I don't know too much about Lord of the Rings outside of the trilogy and The Hobbit, so it was nice to just read up on certain aspects. Although then again, I have no idea what's canon lore and what's WB games pulling a fast one on me, so. The side missions themselves are a lot of nothing. They're essentially act as challenges, stealth 10 guys in four minutes, take out 20 guys without being hit, almost challenge maps from the Arkham games, which makes sense given this entire gameplay system is based on that of the Arkham games. I didn't bother too much with side content, it just didn't appeal to me. It's not like it mattered if I completed everything or not, so I just played what I felt like and left what I didn't. Being a completionist in one of these games must really suck. Now with the structure of main missions, there's an aspect that I really like. 
Games like Shadow of Mordor just don't exist anymore. It's one of the reasons why I loved Days Gone as much as I did. Too many open world games these days act like Witcher clones. I honestly do miss the days of going to a mission marker, hitting start mission, and then playing a set mission with a goal and set things to do. Too many games these days let you add objectives to a quest log so that you can pile up things to do and then methodically blitz through the mundane tasks you've collected over the hours that you've played. Shadow of Mordor having a more traditional mission system was refreshing. Something that at the time may have dragged the game down actually bolsters it for me in 2021, which is impressive. It goes to show that certain game design philosophies or structures aren't necessarily outdated, they just get overused, and when they aren't used as much, revisiting them feels refreshing. There were certain missions, however, don't get me wrong, that were boring. Certain escort missions like this one with Lothariel carrying her hundreds of feet is boring. I'm glad we don't do as much of this anymore in video games. But for the most part, the missions were fun to play as they allowed the core gameplay elements to shine through combat, stealth, and immersion. However, far and away, the best part of Shadow of Mordor is when the main story takes a step back and says, go off and play. The Nemesis system is easily the strongest aspect of this game. Without it, the game could still be fun, but with it, it makes it an impressive experience even by 2021 standards. The Nemesis system was something new and inventive in 2014, something we'd never seen before and who knows when we'll ever see again, as Warner Brothers was actually granted a patent for it. Only Warner Brothers games can use it now and they haven't since Shadow of War. That said though, the Nemesis system is bloody marvellous. It's all about forging your own journey and your own story. It's so engaging. You can remove the main story and just play around in the sandbox for hours. You create your own narrative in that you have encounters with particular orcs. They might best you and get promoted. You can then find those same orcs again in the world and they'll actually remember you, how they beat you and they'll boast about it. Maybe that time you take them down but if you haven't cut their head clean off, odds are they'll come back with injuries to show for it, wanting a rematch. These elements, along with the system of hierarchy in the Orc army of infantry, captains and warchiefs, keep you going round in engaging loops for ages. It's genuinely incredibly enjoyable. It never feels forced, it feels organic and natural. The way it's built into the world and game is forever engaging. With the way the hierarchy works, it also makes it up to you to approach your missions the way that you want. Making sure that if you're going for a war chief to survey beforehand, maybe take out his bodyguards, learn about his weaknesses, and if you're in the second half of the game, gain allies through branding to give you an edge. The second half of the game, adding the option to control orcs and create allies really changes the whole way the game plays players, and adds even more variables for your own journey through Mordor. It's this sort of sandbox control that makes the Nemesis system one of the best systems in any game I've played, and it has so much potential to be more. It's definitely sad to see it patented, but I do hope that Warner Brothers decides to use it more in the future. The possibilities are endless. Now, we talked a lot about the structuring, the story, the systems, but how does it feel to actually play? Does that still hold up in 2021? Well, I'd say that it does. Don't get me wrong, there's some jank here and there. Riding Caragors feels odd, and sometimes walking is a little bit unresponsive, but overall, it's fantastic. Honestly, a lot of modern games could learn from Shadow of Mordor. I don't think I've had as much fun with a sword combat system in a game for a long time. The combat itself plays off of the Batman Arkham system. The combo meter, the countering at the right time, the execution takedowns, the flurry moves, and the free flow system giving you a true power fantasy. Only this time, you aren't just taking down thugs with your fists, you're cutting off limbs, you're slicing off heads, you're shoving your sword through their throat and watching the orc's blood coat your weapon. The power fantasy enabled by this combat system takes things to an entirely new level. And although none of this would make sense in a Batman game, it's incredibly cool to see where that game's base system can be taken when applied to other franchises. The combat itself is simple, yet the complexity it holds is almost endless. I love being able to try out different moves, string together combos, use a flurry to build my combo meter, and then execute nearby foes with ease. You feel powerful, you feel efficient, and it never gets old. Sadly, however, the one place this game does falter is the boss fights. With a combat system so incredible incredibly fun to play, it's really strange that the boss fights aren't better. The fight against the hammer is kind of fun, although a lot of it is building your combo meter by killing orcs and then using an execution move on the boss. It doesn't really lean into player agency. The tower fight has you stealth kill copies of him, and then it's over, and that's it. Uh, but wait, it gets worse. The final boss, the man who killed your entire family, is a quick time event. <laughs> and that's it. 
You don't even get to fight him. It's honestly hilariously bad. It doesn't sour or ruin the journey to get there, or even the narrative weight of the moment. It's just really funny how bad it is. You would have thought with a combat system like this game has, we'd see some incredibly complex boss fights, similar to the Arkham series. But no, they opted to not bother entirely, and I would say it's, it's disappointing to see. Now, stealth is the other core pillar of this game, and man, I have missed stealth that plays like this. I'm all for shit like Hitman, but Shadow of Mordor stealth is something I, I love. It plays similarly to Batman, but is definitely more unique than the combat system. You aren't hiding above your enemies, picking them off one by one. You're moving swiftly around them and dropping them as you can, navigating around a vertical environment to take down orcs and hide back away in the shadows. It's incredibly fun to play. There's a lot of fun to it, although sometimes it can be... Uh, pretty questionable. Well, I, uh, think, think I got him. The one thing it definitely nails, however, is power fantasy, something that is a running theme in this game. You feel powerful, unstoppable even, and it's pretty nice that you feel vulnerable when you're caught. Once you're forced into combat among tons of orcs, you feel weakened. Although the combat system has you feeling very strong, you really can't take them any hits. It's all about being efficient in stealth, and if forced into combat, trying your best to swiftly take down as many as possible without taking much damage. You want a tank, more of a rogue, and the base game definitely conveys that. The soundtrack. Uh, is fine. It's not incredible, but it's also not bad. It just doesn't really live up to The Lord of the Rings. It has some memorable tracks, but it's mostly ambience rather than recognisable melodies. So I was playing the Game of the Year edition, and that meant I could try the DLC that before I'd never played. I opted to completely skip Lord of the Hunt because fuck Torvin. <laughs> nah, he's alright, but I just didn't want to play a few hours of filler garbage hunting. Bright Lord, however, I did want to try. Acting as a prequel to the main game, you play as Celebrimbor in the Second Age and his fight against Sauron. Now, I have no idea how close this is to actual Tolkien lore, but it felt incorrect to say the least. Giving the player the power fantasy of controlling one ring was very cool. The fact that we have this immense power at our fingertips is definitely fun, although it does really feel like you're in a god mode hack where you can just use your abilities without consequence for a while. It's still fun, but maybe not a true representation of using the one ring. I feel like unique abilities should have been available for it. The mission structure itself is pretty repetitive. A lot of it, however, is based around the Nemesis system. You have to go to tower locations and build them to establish dominance against Sauron, and then use your dominance to brand war chiefs and take the fight to him. The only issue here is that the Nemesis system is only fun when you have investment in it. You don't have that here because you aren't playing as the quote-unquote Grave Walker. You lose a core element of what made the system fun to begin with. Without that investment, you're simply killing a bunch of orcs because the game says so, with no real control over who you kill and brand or why. I did not have fun with this, I did to an extent, but it felt a bit drawn out and kinda unnecessary. It also doesn't entirely shed new light on Celebrimbor's origins, it's still just as confusing, maybe even more so now, because the visions we see don't at all line up with the DLC's events. Uh, whatever, I need to stop thinking about this before I have an aneurysm. Oh yeah, and, and this happens. I am the true Lord of the Rings! So, was Shadow of Mordor as good as we all remember? Well, of course, that depends on who you are, but for me, it was almost better than I remember. I remember it being fun, I remember it being good, but I don't remember it being quite as impressive as I found it this time around. The story falters for sure, but the focus isn't on that. The Nemesis system is unique, engaging, and thoroughly interesting. The base gameplay itself takes elements of Warner Brothers and Rocksteady's Batman titles and takes it somewhere new and inventive while staying true to the core power fantasy those games created. The game looks gorgeous and kept me immersed the entire time I played it. I'm glad I went back and revisited it. I'm glad I had the experience that I did, and I'm glad to say that this is a game that although is a lot of the time forgotten, I'll always remember as a pretty solid roadmark in the history of video games.
This video was sponsored by the online learning community, Skillshare. Skillshare offers classes on a bunch of different things. A lot of people have been loving going in and finding new ways to spend their time, and that's great to see as well as supporting the channel with that free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. It's super affordable and you're getting access to a ton of classes on things you might want to learn. You never know the potential career paths learning these skills could open for you. Also, don't forget the deal is still available to you. The first thousand people tip the link down in the description get a one month free trial of Skillshare Premium. It's worth checking out even if you don't think it's something you'd necessarily be interested in because even just signing up for the free trial helps support me and also gets you access to a world of creativity you might not have thought about before. As always, if you do check it out with my link and decide to learn a new skill, tweet the results to me or hit me up on Discord. I'd love to see what you've all been learning how to do using Skillshare. Thank you all so much for tuning into this video. I really do appreciate it. I've been enjoying sitting back and replaying some old stuff. I've got an, I've got a few other videos in mind to do down the line. Obviously, Shadow of War would be one to do because it was a game I actually didn't like, even though I really liked Shadow of Mordor. So it'd be interesting to revisit and see if my opinions have changed, whether they're the same, whether they're even worse. Um, but that would be a fun one to do. Let me know your thoughts, though, on Shadow of Mordor down below and any other old games you'd like me to do. Like I said, Shadow of War is one, but Sleeping Dogs is another. Saints Row is another franchise I'd like to go back and make some sort of video on. There is a, a ton of ton of stuff I would like to make. Um, so that's going to be good. I've got plenty of stuff going on. If you want to go and support me further, though, I do have another channel um, called It's Lazen Boy, which is linked down below, where I post most of my chilled stuff, my discussion stuff, news-related stuff. It's kind of what this channel used to be, but this channel has evolved into just being my best work, my video essays, my, my retrospectives, my critiques, my analysis, you know, that sort of stuff. And I felt like I needed somewhere else to put my more chill content, and that's all on It's Lazer Boy, as well as uh, edited down stream content. And if you want to join me for streams, I stream over on Twitch pretty damn frequently. So the link is down below to that, twitch.tv forward slash It's Lazer Boy. Uh, come join me over there, have a chat. Um, it's the most fun part of streaming is chatting with everyone, so definitely... Uh, don't 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 be shy. Come along, come along, come along and say hi, and we can chat about fucking video games and shit. It's a ton of fun. Um, anyway, that's it for this video. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Big big thank you to everybody still supporting over on Patreon. Hopefully soon I'll be back to Clubhouse. Um, I just you know give me a bit more time uh, to just slowly ease into everything, and eventually I'll be back on the Clubhouse podcast over on Patreon. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see. Anyways, thank you guys so much for joining me for this one, and I'll uh, see you all very soon for something else. All right, catch you later. Bye bye. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm.